it's got to be the right, it can't be too long because there's no thread on that. Okay, yeah. yeah. Now that we had arrived in France, it was time to turn our attention to the canals. Our intention was always to take Ruby Rose to the Atlantic, and we could do this either the long way round, by going west through Gibraltar, then up against the prevailing winds around the coast of Spain, then Portugal, or we could take the short way, which is through the Canal de Midi and the Canal de Garonne. This is jointly known as the Canal des Deux Mers. With canal depths of only around one to one and a half meters, these canals are only really possible for shallow draft vessels. This is not an issue for us. We actually had our southerly built because of its swing keel. We draw less than 80 centimeters with the keel fully up. The other consideration we had to make is to air draft. The canals were built for barges, not sailing boats. And so to fit under these bridges, we knew we'd have to put the mast on deck or have her transported. Our original plan had been to transport by road. However, there was a last minute change of dates and the transport company, they messed us about a little bit. And so facing either waiting three weeks on the Atlantic coast of France or transporting the mast on deck, we decided to transport our own mast. We therefore needed to build a frame that was able to hold a 200 kilogram, 16 meter long aluminium mask without damaging it or losing it over the side. We had never built anything like this before. So the start point was always the internet. We took some ideas from other sailing boats that have transited the canal. We talked to Paul and Cheryl of Distant Shores about their frame because they did this in a southerly about 10 years ago. From reading the literature, and looking at all the information available on the internet, we knew that the lowest bridge had a clearance of 3.3 meters. And our air draft from waterline to the Bimini was just shy of three meters. With only 30 centimeters to play with, we decided that the mast needed to sit underneath the Bimini rather than going on top. And so this became the starting point for our calculations. We had to measure from the waterline to the top of what was gonna be the T piece of our A-frame. Still solar pool? No. Right, now come here, I'll show you how to do this. So you always put your finger along the saw like this and make sure it allows you to cut straighter and you look down on it and you follow that line. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you brace it there. Yeah. And you cut through but follow the line. Yeah. Okay? So get your thing started. Yeah? Right, that's good. Am I doing it? Yeah, but use longer strokes and lighter strokes, don't push down. this make sure we got it right. We started by making a basic join. This would allow the crossbar of the teepees to sit comfortably on the downward strut and distribute the loads through it. Where's the pencil? Oh, in my hair. Not in the hair. It is in my hair. It's a one note. Once we had measured twice and cut once, we managed to get the T-piece completely square and at the correct height to the waterline. We then started the long and lengthy process of getting the angles correct for the supporting struts. These angles needed to be absolutely precise to make sure that the clearance at the top of the frame was below three meters. These side pieces of the A-frame also had to be constructed so that the angles did not obstruct or foul any part of the boat. I think that's right. Look right to you. Yep. Mm -hmm. 
in the end to allow for extra robustness but also to be able to deal with a slight discrepancy in the width of the boat we decided to make the sides of the A-frame double thickness. This had two functions. The first was to actually provide extra strength, but the second meant that the two sides could be moved very slightly. This allowed us to match the foot of the A-frame perfectly with the contours of the deck. Once the A-frame had been constructed, we loosely bolted it together with 10 mm coach bolts and oversized washers. Loosely bolting it allowed it to be flexible enough for us to manhandle onto the deck and get it into place so that it was perfectly positioned both to port and starboard and fore and aft. It was super important here that the T-piece was completely upright. Once in place, the coach bolts were tightened using a spirit level at each point to make sure that the T-piece was completely perpendicular to the deck. And a top tip here, if your boat does not sit completely trim and there is a lilt either to port or starboard, use an electronic spirit level which is found on most smartphones to work out exactly how many degrees the boat is listing to and then take your measurements from there to build your T-piece. We are up bright and early in um, Port Vendre, Port Vendre. Um, the reason is we have a long upwind sail today, which is um, something I never relish, <laughs> but hopefully it will be pleasant. Um, we are off to Agda, we have a, a weather window to get to Agda. Agda is the position and the place where we're going to get our mast drop. Okay, that's a pretty little town. So we are on, I guess, what you would call a broad, no, beam reach, close reach, somewhere between a close reach and a beam reach. Our wind angle is about 70 degrees, so that's good. That's better than I expected. I thought we'd be beating all day, but that's nice. Got a couple of reefs in the main and uh, we've reefed the jib a little bit as well. Would you call this a beam reach? Or a close reach? I think a close reach. It's a broad reach. No, a broad reach is deeper than a beam reach. Yeah. Anyway, it's nice. There's nothing wrong with this. We're not on too much of a lean. There's no swell, uh, which is lovely. And uh, I have to say, after years of sailing in the Atlantic with that constant Atlantic swell, not that that's a problem really, but to be on a reach with no swell is really nice. Shaking these reefs out in a bit. I know, we're only doing, well we're doing six knots now, but yeah, the wind's dropped off a little bit. Let's let's see how it settles. You know, yeah, you leave it 20 minutes before you do anything. But it's a beautiful, beautiful day. Bright sunshine, it's kind of warm-ish underneath the spray hood. And the scenery is spectacular. I can see the Pyrenees from here. It's beautiful, isn't it, Nick? Yep. No, it is. If Gran Turismo was a sailing game, this would be the. This would be the. Uh... I don't know what Gran Turismo is. Oh, it's a racing. It's a video game. It's a video game. Is it one of those cars ones? Yeah, but well, you know when they do all this kind of like perfect scenery. Yeah. And this is when you see all the kind of promotional videos for boats. They take obviously bring the boats to somewhere here. Yeah. You know, you've got oh yeah, snow in the mountains. You know. Yeah. So you can see right there. Pyrenees. Lovely. Are you happy, Skipper? Yes, I am. Once you, once I get a cup of tea from your flask, I'm oh, I see. Half, yeah? Well, for once, I'm quite organised. So here you You're go. You're always organised. I'm not. I'm definitely not always organised. In fact, I'm always disorganised. But today, I thought I'm going to organise myself. Flask. Macbeth cup. <laughs> this is a Christmas present from Nick's mother, I think. Wasn't it? Yeah, nice cup of tea. Get that into you. Nice cup of tea. The 
so we're getting a bit lively. We've got wind strength up to about 20, 22 knots, and uh, the swell's picked up now. So it's getting a bit less comfortable than it was earlier, which is a shame. But that's just the way it is. We've just reefed down again, um, and that's improved things, I think, somewhat. So slowed us down, yeah. Making what about five, five and a half knots? Still not too bad. What's our arrival time? Five. Once we were settled into the marina, we could start preparing the boat for unstepping the mast. We had to take off anything that stood higher than the bimini, such as the wind generator. We also had to remove the sails and store them in the fore cabin. Usually we flake the sails on the pontoon, but today we tried a different method of flaking them on the deck. The idea is to lower the main sail so it falls to one side of the boom and then to flake it on the coach roof on the opposite side, using the boom to take the weight of the sail. This worked so well that I wish we'd tried this method out years ago. So today's job is to get the boom down and we are also going to build the other part of our A-frame. So we've built the section that will go um, across the transom and now we need to build the, the forward one. Nick is in full work mode, yes, looking very focused and I've been summoned so let us go and get this boom off. Now once the sails had been removed from the boat, flaked and stowed below, removing the boom was simply a matter of attaching the halyard and the topping lift to each end and then slowly lowering it onto deck onto wooden blocks so that the aluminium would not mark or scuff the fiberglass. The construction of the frame for the fore of the boat was very similar to the construction for the aft. We now knew the template. The important thing here was to make sure that both the fore and the aft were exactly at the same height above the waterline. This would ensure that when the mast was placed on deck, the back or the front of the mast would not sit higher than the three metres we had allocated for clearance under those bridges. There was, however, a considerable amount of work to do before we managed to get the mast unstepped and put onto the deck. We also had to consider labelling carefully the wiring for all the equipment at the masthead, including the radar, the NEMA data and the lights. Another job on our list was the preparation of the shrouds. Firstly, the position and the tension on the shrouds and the turnbuckles was marked using a Sharpie marker, then insulating tape on top of that. We then straightened the split pins so they were easy to remove at the day and on the day of unstepping. We also lubricated the turnbuckles with a silicon lubricant to make sure that they did not seize and they were easy to turn, making unstepping faster and easier. We also made sure that every component was placed into sealable sandwich bags and labelled and placed in a very secure location so that when we came to re-step the mast, we had all the components, knew where everything was and where everything would fit. Once we had the A-frame in place, it was really important to brace it against fore and aft movement and any lateral movement. We did this in a few ways. Firstly, we lashed the feet of the A-frame to the deck at strong points. This meant that the base could not move. We then used a 16mm line from the aft part of the boat to brace it and make sure that it was upright. We then used cargo straps to tension forward. This meant that once the straps were tensioned, the A-frame could not move either fore or aft or laterally because it was against the tow rail. Similarly, we used small squares of carpet against the tow rail between the base of the A-frame and the fiberglass to stop it from marking. We then had to mouse the halyards and anything that ran up to the deck from the mast. These were then labelled and tied up and then I took a little rest. So it seems like this afternoon it's finally going to be time to take the mast off the boat. We have been waiting for four days now and uh, yeah I have to say that we're both very very ready to get on with it quite frankly so they're gonna have to take the mast off and then they'll leave it for a couple of hours so that we can get ourselves organized and then either this evening or maybe more likely tomorrow morning uh, he'll put the mast back onto the boat so yes we're ready to get going on our adventure through the French canals
The gentleman who ran the Chantier Allemand Yard was called Henri, and he was very experienced. We recommend him wholeheartedly. Once he got the crane into position, he climbed the mast without a harness, mind you, and attached the mast to the hook of the crane with a length of rope. This done, he took up the slack, and once the crane was supporting the weight of the mast, Nick and the others set about disconnecting the standing rigging. To say that this was a nerve-wracking experience is a vast understatement. We did trust Henri, but having 200 kilos of aluminium mast hanging above your boat and your head is a very disconcerting experience. However, he got the job done brilliantly without a single scratch on the mast. Now that the mast was safely unstepped, we had to prepare it to be lowered into the frame in the morning. This meant disconnecting the spreaders, removing all items such as the radar, the masthead trial light, the wind vane, the turnbuckles from the shrouds, etc. And then securing the shrouds and the stays to the mast. Tomorrow, um I want to cling film wrap all the electrical connections mm -hmm. and then start building the protection for either end. Now, yes. what does that mean if they're done? I'll tell you what it means. It means that after today and after everything, uh, we deserve, we both deserve a libation. I'm feeling a bit nervous. Nick seems relatively sanguine, which is reassuring. What, what? That was fun and stressful, and I'm just glad it's over, to be honest. I have no idea how to do it, my love. We're on the Canal du Midi! I am supremely happy. I know, life is so good right now.